City University Television. In association with the Center for Advanced Study in Theater Arts. And the Harold Clerman Endowment. Presents Spotlight. Welcome to the Harold Clarman Seminar on Theater. I'm Ed Wilson, and my guests today are two of America's most talented and well-known performers, Miss Ann Jackson and Mr. Eli Wallach. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. And in private life, they are Mr. and Mrs. Wallach. And I want to start off with a story uh, or the tale of a play, Major Barbara, which uh, I think we, were you with. I know you were in it, and were mm -hmm. you in it as well? Yes. What uh, and. Well, was, I, Charles, I, was, this, was Charles Lawton in Charles it? Charles Lawton was the director and the star of Both. Major Barbara. And we took it out of town. Uh, he said to me, you're going to play the greatest comedy creation since Falstaff. I was playing Bill Walker, Cockney Tough. Right. And I thought, how do I play a Cockney? You know? I was terrified of even playing an Oriental, I, you know, but a Cockney. He said, I don't care about the accent. And Shaw, in writing the play, wrote, go, G-A-O-W, gow, gow, I'm gow. So, <laughs> so Lawton said, I'm not worried about that. I just need you to play your tough guy. And so, so I did. He said, now I hear you're, you're one of these method actors and the studio actor, studio disciple. This is the greatest comedy creation for, since Falstaff. And furthermore, I want no Stanislavski crap from you. <laughs> so I said, oh, all right. Then uh, Glynis Johns was playing Barbara, and she left after we opened, and Anne replaced her. And Anne was um, a delicious Barbara. What was it like playing with, was playing with Lawton? Were you uh, a little uh, in awe of him, or...? In awe of him. When I was a kid, I d did imitations. And oh, I, did you? Uh, yes, I won a contest at my movie theater when I was about 11. And Charles Lawton, I'm sure I got it because I imitated Charles Lawton from Mutiny on the Bounty. And, uh, or Les Miserables. I, I used to say, I'm doing Les Miserables with Charles Lafton. <laughs> and I wasn't being funny. You I didn't know how to pronounce... Either one. Either one. But I did that in Brooklyn, and none of the Brooklynites knew that I was saying it wrong either. But tell but about anyway. the latch key. Oh, uh, oh, well, we had... Charles was, was a, a, a brilliant uh, diagnostician of, you know, of a play. And uh, when he was working with me on, on Major Barbara, uh, he took me to see uh, Dame Sybil Thorndike. Who, was, uh, who had played the original Joan and had played Barbara. And he took me to her dressing room and said, uh, Sybil, I want you to, this is my new Barbara, and I want you to read a scene with me. Well, this woman was in her 80s, and Charles was, you know, he was in his 60s. He looked like he was in his 80s in an, an old ratty raincoat. Anyway, he sat down and they read the love scene between Adolphus and Barbara, these two older, brilliant actors. I was so moved. I sat in the corner and as the tears welled up in my eyes, of course, they went even further. I mean, Charles <laughs> yes. loved that. You know, and the dressing room was so tiny. Sure. We were so close. We were almost touching knees. And when he brought me back to my theater, uh, to the theater, and he brought, he left Sybil, he said to me, well, what did you think of her, Annie? And I said, oh, well, Charles, you know, being articulate. Oh, I said, she, oh, I, uh, oh, oh, oh. And he said, a bit of a ham, isn't she? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. It was, he, uh, he was very bossy and um, a perfectionist and, uh, and uh, with a very rigid idea of how Barbara, you know, it was a debate and he'd say to me, don't frown, don't make a fist, Barbara's a lady and, you know, I had to be very English. Well, I was going crazy trying to be very English and, you know, and not feisty and fighty about my Barbara and one night I just broke all the rules. I didn't, I wasn't in the place I should have been at. I just let him have it when I, when we had the fight about Papa, you know, what is uh, poverty and that speech. 
And because I defied him, he played his poverty speech so brilliantly. It was so brilliant. It was, I mean, we had fire coming out of our eyes and mouths. And when I came off stage, I thought, I don't care what happens. I don't care. His dresser took me by the hand and led me right into Charles Lawton. And he looked in the mirror, his hair all matted down from perspiration. And he said to me, all right now, Annie. You've earned your latch key. That was one of the lines oh, in the play. He said, that's what I mean about Greek drama. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> terrific. And you thought maybe he was going to... I thought he was going to fire me. Yes. And I thought, I, 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 just let him fire me. That, well, you, you were feeling... Well, you, you said that before, when you have felt that you were right about something, yes. you were always better off following your own yes. instincts. Yes. And this was, I guess, a, a real good lesson in that for yes. you. Yes. I want to talk a little bit about your playing together. Uh, you've done, we were talking about it just before we began the show, 10, 12, 13 plays you've done together, mm. uh, and a lot of comedy. You did several of Murray Shiskel's plays. Love, was it Twice Around the Park? Yes. And, uh, Typus and Typus Tiger. and the Tiger. Tell me about playing with each other and playing with the audience in terms of comedy and when it works best and when you run into trouble with that. You have to be truer than true. You have to you? mean what you say. And it's, it, of course, it's exaggerated truth because it's the other side of the, you know, the, it's the two poles, the smile and the, the, uh, the tears, the, the, the tragic, tragic mask. mask. Um, but with, with comedy, it's, uh, uh, you, you just have to endow it with such belief. You know, it's bigger than life. It's like uh, what I loved about the play... Um, uh, lend me a tenor, was the way it was directed when that man was supposed to have been dead. And Bosco says to the boy, the boy says he's dead. And Bosco says, who? And they build that so that it is so true, it almost goes into, tra you know, you say, oh my drama. God, into serious drama. And it would not have been as funny or as delicious if they had not built it, built it on that kind of oh, truth. Wasn't well, it wonderful? But, we, but we, we, we operate like a good, a good team in baseball, a good pitcher and catcher. Uh, you, once I learned the lesson about, in, you know, I was in the rep, American Repertory Theatre, we spent a year with Eva Legallion, and I was acting with an actor named Ernest Truex, who was a yes. famous old actor. And I said at one matinee, boy, do I get a laugh there. And he looked at me and he said, you do? I said, yes, I do. He said, all right. The next performance, I didn't get the laugh, which taught me a valuable lesson that you don't do it yourself. There has to be... With somebody. Be, did he do something to well, pull the, pull I the didn't rug know. out from under? I didn't know under. what it yeah. was. But uh, we... Um, when you all are working on a play and a comedy and trying to find the humor in it through this process of being honest and true, you... Uh, is it a matter of trial and error, or do is it intuition? What is it when you're working together? Well, well things happen sometimes uh, uh, unplanned. I, I think the height of a creative thing is when you don't try to pick it up. You don't try to pre-plan it. You don't try to build it in, with, with blueprints. It has to happen. You have to be free and open, and then it'll happen. Are there moments that you can remember from Love or Typist and the Tiger or... Well, well for example, I'll give you an example. Okay. We're playing a scene in Cafe Crown. Yes. And I haven't seen her in three months. And I say, Madam, uh, I, all I can think of is poem. I know so many poems, so many love scenes. They wither in my throat. I'm an awkward amateur, Romeo. I can only think of one word, beautiful. Beautiful Madam Cole. And I bend over to kiss her hand. And she's looking, she picks up a spoon. Now, she'd never done this before. She picked up a spoon, and she looked at her reflection in the spoon. She's a famous actress. And she did this, and I thought to myself, wait a minute, I've just made this glorious speech. And, she's, and, and, and then I thought, that's wonderful. It's great to find a thing like that to, and to use it. Sometimes... Was this in rehearsal or during no, the run? No, during a performance. During, during, during a performance? Yes. And the idea was you were looking at your reflection then when he was praising... Well, I just picked up the spoon and, and what it... I don't know why I did it, except that he was supposed to be such a phony. And, uh, you know, when he's going on about how beautiful I am, I looked, in the, I looked in the spoon to check my beauty. I don't know what I... But see, now those things happen if you're relaxed enough and free enough. It, 
I often deplore the fact that critics come the first night or the second night or the third night. Pap downtown. Joseph Pap, yes. Joseph Pap works on a wonderful idea. He doesn't tell the tell you when the critics are coming. Oh, really? You do previews. You for, do. You play for weeks. You know. But, but you know, the, when you're doing comedy. Uh, the audience will take the play away from you very easily, and especially in a Chiscal play, because he's a very funny writer, and he builds jokes like uh, uh, bases loaded and you get a home run. And uh, you have to go deeper into the play. You have to, in order to control the audience and to... You mean to they'll be laughing too much, or they'll be laughing, uh, they'll get they'll carried away? They'll jump the gun. Ah. They'll jump the gun. But they won't jump the gun with you if they're enjoying watching you... If you're controlling it and you're in, they're enjoying watching your reaction to what I say, it has to be between the two people. And the relationship that builds. Yes, and the relationship that, that builds. Have you all ever, as husband and wife, has one of you ever stepped on the other one's lines or undercut the other one's? Oh, sometimes, sometimes. And, uh, but not deliberately. Oh, I know not, no, not deliberately. Yeah. Oh, I know, never. I wasn't yeah. thinking about that. Yeah. But I just, and then how, but I mean, is it working together that closely? Well, for, for example, one night, one night on the way to the theater, we had a tremendous fight uh, of some other subject. We get into the, into the theater, I've tied her in a chair, and I've threatened her, and she Is says... Is this in Twice Around the... No, in, the, uh, no, in uh, the Tiger. Oh, yes, the Tiger. She looks up at me, and she says, I, I, she says, you have kind-looking eyes. And I said, shut up. Well, it had an added quality that night. That it was, <laughs> because of the well, argument in the car? Yeah, yeah it wasn't planned on the, before. On the way. But, of course, that, uh, the, but you're able, obviously, to get into the part. And then the fact that you are so aware of each other, I'm sure, in terms of anticipating the response, even when it's the, the thing with the spoon, when something is unplanned like that, you realized very quickly what she was doing there. Oh, yeah. Because you kn you know her so well. Yeah. But you see, you have to put a cr aside a critical. Th there's that tem temptation to be critical and editorial in your own mind as you're playing. You know. You Let me ask you about because you've talked about the audience, and the audience could get carried away or could take it away from you. What about the difference between performing in the theater, on stage, and in film or on television in terms of the audience? Because in film, you certainly don't have. Uh, you don't have an audience, and in television, most of the time, you don't have an audience. That's right. And is that is that a problem? Does that make a? I big think it's it's the it's the lure and the magnet that pulls the actor, the true actor, back to the theater all the time, because there's the only <clears throat> real contact that he has. An actor in films, you'll you'll open a door and, and say, "I will not." That's all. It'll take you half a day to shoot that, and, and I don't know how gratifying it is. It isn't to me. Uh, although people get a lot more acclaim for movie work than they do for stage work, but the most satisfying for me is doing it on stage. Because of the audience, and yes. because of the fact that I guess it's different every night. No two per, uh, now, you've both been in long runs. What are some of the, what is, what are some of the longest runs you've been love, in? Love, love. You was, love was a Waltz long of the run. Toreadors, and you did for over a year. You did for over a year. And, and the Typus and Tiger, we did not only on the stage here, we did it in London, we did it in California, we did it uh, as a television. Uh, what about that age-old question that people always want to know in terms of performers? How do you keep it fresh? How do you keep it new when you've done something for a year or a year and a half? A play, the same part over and over again. Some actors don't like to do it. Some actors get restless and, and bored. Do you yeah. like to do it? Do both yeah, of you I like do. to do it? Yes. Do you like to do it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, it's like with, with, with the spoon or things that Eli has found as, as an actor in, in a part that after playing a part for months and months and months, all of a sudden one night, and you don't know why, it's something's been planted of, of the character, and you'll do something and you don't really know why you do it. You just do it because it's, it's instinctive then. And I've seen him do, do uh, things, uh, for example, we were doing the typists, and I am in life nearsighted. In other words, I have to hold things close to see and take my glasses off now to see it. And Eli is farsighted. So we're doing the typists, and of course I select as my character to be farsighted as I get older. So I'm typing like this, and all of a sudden, one night,
After I've been doing this in rehearsal, the whole thing, I've been typing like this. I look over and I see Eli like this. <laughs> <laughs> and I almost went up. I thought, oh, my God. <laughs> well, the audience adores things sure, like that. Absolutely. And that came after, after months of playing. Yes. The thing with, with film is that you can get wonderful effects. The director and the editors can get wonderful effects for you uh, uh, with spontaneous things. But you don't find that kind of growth in, in a thing. That's what keeps it fresh. That's what makes it fun to act. After a while, you, you, you know that the challenge is this audience is seeing it for the first time. And they bring, an audience has a personality. Don't sure you do. think so, Eli? They bring something to, to you, and you get more daring. Do you have to learn, because in comedies, of course, they must vary enormously. Some must laugh uproariously, and another night they'll be very quiet. But I know myself, as being an audience member, that on some of those nights when they're quiet, they're really enjoying it tremendously. Is that we something? We saw sure. Lend Me a Tenor the other night. Oh, and yeah, we went backstage that. because we were over the moon. We, we just loved the performances and loved the act, you know, the play and, and, and the director. We laughed and carried on. We went backstage and, uh, and... Every one of them. Bosco, every Garber. Bosco, first Garber, and then Phil Bosco, and then, uh, the girl. The, girl. the, the whole they cast. All, they, whole cast. They said, oh, no. Oh, Why we did you had come a terrible tonight? Night. It was off. It was off. It was, it was wonderful. And I said to, to Raul Julia, who was there, I said, you know, it's a lesson to us. You have to work harder when the audience isn't laughing where you're expecting them to. You have to go deeper into the play. And they went into that play. They were just glorious. And it, it turned out to be, as far as you were concerned, it was a marvelous evening. Yes, yes. for us wonderful. it was. And you, couldn't, wonderful. you can't tell that to the actor, though, because no. he, he remembers, you know, a baseball yeah. player plays 100 games, 160 games, he thinks, Oh, I remember when I got a single and a hit and a home run and so on. He, the audience is different each, each game. We, uh, you can take the measure of an audience pretty quickly, you know. You can tell, uh-oh, tonight I'm in At for it. At the beginning, uh, yeah. within the first three or four yes, or five minutes. Yes, yes, yes. And, well, now, I want to change just a little bit and talk about, because we've been talking about the audience, and talk about the, the great variety of roles that the both of you have played. Do you enjoy that? Do you enjoy going from in your case from uh, the rose tattoo uh, the kind of part you played there and then kilroy and then in staircase and then oh, uh, the staircase that was some play because you were playing what a homosexual barber you yes. know, which is of course very in manchester and uh, uh, which, which bristol. is bristol well you and british and then you've played sakini the oriental do you enjoy that variety yes i do i do and, uh, well... Now, I, I lead a Jekyll and Hyde life. In the movies, I usually play Mexican bandits or killers or the mafia and so on. on the you're, stage, you're more typecast, in other yes. words, in the movies. On the stage, I tended to play more the little man, the... the put the upon. The put upon. Me. Yeah. What about working on things like accents and, uh, uh, you know, going from the Japanese to the Cockney to uh, whatever the Manchester thing is. You know, I, I'll tell one quick one. I, I, I used to peek through the curtain, and I think someday they're going to catch me because I'm playing an Oriental. And is this, this is in the tea house tea of the house, August yes. moon. And yes. I saw four Japanese men sitting in the front row. Well, the captain says to me in the play, tell them there's going to be rice for everyone. And all the Japanese went out of my head, that performance. I couldn't remember anything except the school will have five sides. So he'd say, tell them there's going to be rice. I said, the school will have five sides in Japanese. The Japanese thought I'd gone crazy. The <laughs> cast thought I'd gone crazy. But I'm, I'm terrified of accents. You said you're from Tennessee. Yes. I once was offered a script to play a flamboyant lawyer named Arkansas Fredericks. I said, I can't play Arkansas. How am I going to play Arkansas? They said, we'll rewrite the script. They sent me the script a week later and they changed his name to Tennessee Fredericks. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't it was care. That was a big help. It just, I, it's just across the border. But Meryl Streep makes a career. You know, yes, she, she she's does. brilliant at, at accents. I, I she's think, brilliant at acting. Oh, she's an actress. She's, but she does, that's one of her real specialties. Yes, is and she's she has an ear. The work on, yeah. the, work yeah. on the accents. And it's I, almost like a writer mm -hmm, uh, capturing, exactly. capturing the sound, really. Yeah. But I, you, you know, I, I grew up with Italians in Italian neighborhoods, so I, I learned the rhythms of, of uh, Italians. Mexico, I spent a lot of time in Mexico. So, so a lot of it is what you've heard and been able to, yeah, uh, it's to translate. Yeah, it's, it, it's back in your, It's back in your head. Yeah. 
What about some of the other people other than playing with each other that you particularly, you've particularly enjoyed playing with? Because you've played with uh, a lot, everybody from Charles Lawton, whom we've mentioned, to Walter Matthau, uh, Gig to Young. In, Gig Young, Ingrid, Ingrid Bergman. Bergman. Yes, tell me about the, some of the people you've enjoyed most playing with and, and why, why it worked as far as you were concerned. Well, with Gig Young, uh, to start with Gig, who I considered a very wonderful actor, uh, we did O Men, O Women yes. together as, as young actors. And that was a big hit. And it was yes. And uh, actually, they had wanted Walter Matthau for that play, but Walter didn't want to do it. And I only knew Walter. I kept saying, Walter, do that play. But anyway, uh, Gig came and read, and I had read with a lot of, of actors. And when he read, I knew, I knew that that was the actor. And fortunately, uh, so did Eddie Chodorov and so did uh, Cheryl Crawford. But to answer your question, he was, uh, Gig was the kind of actor that, who was um, so genuine and, and so eccentric in a, in a way that you couldn't anticipate how he'd say anything or how he'd do anything. He w it was like a little You mean off. his line readings each night yes. were a little different? It, no, I mean as a, just his presentation, just the way Gig was. You know, he, he had a, a comic... Off-center. Off-center quality about him so that you had to listen. You know what I mean? Sure. Uh, so and with Walter? Oh, Walter, yeah. Walter was really something. Walter taught me an acting lesson that I thought I knew when I worked with Walter. Uh, he said uh, I had to go and, and uh, get a check. He'd say to me, go over there, open the envelope, uh, and uh, take out a $100 bill. And, uh, and I was supposed to do that. So I... I was very emotional in the, in the scene that we just had, so I went and he said, go over there and take the thing, and I took it, and I took out the money, and he said to me, wait a minute, what did you take out of my wallet? And I thought, oh my God, I said, a hundred dollar bill, and he said, yeah, well, don't take it, and they said, cut, and when we did it again, he said, you didn't wait for me to say it. I said, forgive me, guru. Forgive me, guru. <laughs> you didn't wait for him to say, go get the I hundred? Didn't, no, I didn't wait for him to say, now take a hundred dollar bill. Oh, I see. He said, you see, you don't listen. Isn't that And sad? that was in the, that was also part of the, but he did it so gracefully, he didn't make me. Well, that's one of the problems in acting. The first month or so, you don't listen. You're only concerned about your lines. Yeah. You know? Right. In the old days of the theater, 50 years ago, when you got your part, you didn't get the complete play. You got sides. You got the last three words that the person spoke. The dot, 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 and I think so. And what he well, did you was... You just got your cue, in other words. You got your cue. So yeah. <laughs> you listen to the other person to hear those last three words. And it's a I, good lesson in I acting. would like to tell you another lovely, lovely little story, if I may. I didn't mention Dane Clark because I thought maybe I, Eli would get jealous. We did two for the seesaw together. <laughs> And uh, Dane, Dane is a lovely actor, beautiful actor. And we, one night, oh, this was terrible. One night, I'm in the, in the bed and I'm fighting with him and I throw something. I'm in my bra. I throw something at him and my bra opens. And we're playing this in the round. Well, I want to tell you, I mean, this is before people were letting it all yes. hang out. And I was, I'm not one of those exhibitionists. So he takes the blouse, he takes the blouse at the foot of the bed, and he comes over very gently, and he does this to me, and he says, cover yourself. It was just <laughs> oh, so wonderful. And, and the, completely improvised. Completely improvised, and it was as though the, and the audience was so respectful of, of that moment. And, I mean, it was wonderful. That was quick thinking. Yeah, oh, well, yeah. you, you both, both must have had to pick things up when something oh, happened yeah. like that uh, on a number of occasions. She, oh, she, yeah. she had to drink water out of a drinking fountain. And, and, oh, oh. and for some reason she did it, and, and the thing wouldn't stop running. And finally, by hitting it and so on, it stopped. I came in, and my business was to go to the fountain to take a, <laughs> oh, to take a drink. She said when it was leaking, oh, dear. That was her line. Oh, dear. She oh, said, dear. Oh I dear. couldn't get it to stop. Now, I come on, and she's t 
terrified. I've got to go and do it. So I do it, and of course it happens again. The water, and I said, "Oh dear." <laughs> oh, I went. I went. I just went up and that <laughs> broke out. Well, you know that water fountain had a life of its own. It went. <laughs> it was terrible. What show was this? Was this? This, this was in the, the typist. typist. So, oh, the typist. And, uh, but you know, you were saying something really interesting a moment ago about listening, because this, as you talked about Walter Matthau saying to you, and you were saying about the sides, this really is uh, a thing that an actor, an actress has to learn, because the, the, the temptation, as you say, is really to just play your part and not listen intently. You're so nervous about how you're going to do. Yeah. Well, good, wonder, good movie actors, screen actors, listen very carefully. They listen and they think. Yeah. I tell you who, who uh, was very good at, at that, too, uh, uh, other than Eli. Yeah, Eli. Well, it was Shirley MacLaine is a good listener. She's a good actress. And Ingrid Bergman was wonderful. Why, she really? I learned a, I learned a, a, a lovely lesson from her. She said, uh, I was carrying a pocketbook, and it was our, uh, practically our first scene together in, in Golda. And uh, she said to me, what's in that? And I said, I don't know. And she said, well, get something and put it in. She said, never, never use a, a pocketbook as a prop, Annie. Isn't that something? She have said, something in there. Yeah, that, have something uh, so in there. It, it, It'll give you. And it was wonderful that she said it because uh, th I was then able to use it, you know. And did you put, and you put something in there? Yes, I did. I did. And, of course, when we did Cafe Crown, see how things pay off. We were doing Cafe Crown, and I had a handkerchief in the, in the bag that I carried. And I had a whole bit of business with this handkerchief that would go in my sleeve, and I'd offer it to him. And, and it all came from Ingrid. So really, the, the things build like this. You, you build a really a storehouse, it seems to me, yeah. of material that you've used from you, and you can reach way back then. And well, the mind is a very interesting mechanism. It stores things. And it, you, you, you remember when you say a thing like this? Oh, he was in, what was his name, what was his name? And you can't, think for the life of you, think of his name. Twenty minutes later, you'll blurt out his name. Yes. Because the little man up there is going through the files and, and saying, it's this. Now, in I acting... I have a little woman. <laughs> <laughs> well, of on, course. The, on this note of uh, the little, little woman and the little man and remembering things, I'm afraid we're going to have to store this half hour because this is the end of our time, and I want to thank... Ann Jackson and Eli Wallace. We want to thank Harold Clerman, Harold Clerman and Ed Wilson and, and Ed Wilson Well, thank you so much. Yes. This has been the Harold Clerman Seminar in Theater. I'm Ed Wilson. Thank you for being with us.